All right, hello out there. Here we are with Badger Rock, rooted at Badger Rock, um, continuing with our virtual Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month workshop series. So we are very excited to be joined by Ann Vang this morning to talk about her work. Um, there are so many things that Ann is a part of, and Ann, I'd love if you could just introduce yourself and start with just sharing some of your story with us. Sure, thank you, Sarah. Um, Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to keep spreading my um, story. Um, my name is Ann Va. I grew up in Stevens Point. Um, interesting fact is I was actually not born here. But when we moved here um, when I was about six months old and we never left. And when my grandfather got sick, I was like, you know, I've always wondered why did we end up here in Stevens Point, like out of everywhere? Why Stevens Point? He's like, oh, the housing was cheap. So that's how we ended up here in Stevens Point, um, and I just never left. Um, I currently reside here with my partner um, and my family. Um, I went to school here, kindergarten all the way through high school, and then my higher education, I attended Mid-State Technical College here in Stevens Point. Um, funny thing is, I never imagined myself in like food access or agriculture work at all. Um, I went to school for financial services, worked at a credit union after I worked years in manufacturing. Um, after that, um, I ended up getting my CNA and then I worked at various places. My job before was also at a nonprofit for domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and so that's where sort of like a lot of the advocating came from. So like my lens through like food security is advocating and like um, social justice, food justice. And so I'm kind of where I am now um, being here at Farm Shed. Uh, it really came organic to do providing support for home farmers and getting them into different programs. Uh, it really came down to when I started working here, I went straight to the source for the products that I needed. And they started telling me that, hey, you know, we're losing our land, um, you know, and so we offered to rent it from him the next year and we'll get some to till it for us. But unfortunately, he had already rented it out to someone else. And so that's kind of where it started organically. Um, so, yeah, I mean. I did not vision myself in this position even three years ago. Um, I've been at Farm Shed for almost three years and then at Groundswell for almost a year now. So um, you came to this work through av an advocacy and social justice lens, it sounds like. Um, in your family story, do you want to share a little bit about that? How your uh, family ended up in Wisconsin? Yeah, so again, um, we moved here um, I know my parents have resided, I believe, for a little bit in Wausau and then in the Twin Cities. And then interesting enough, I was actually born in Portland, Oregon. That's where my maternal um, family is from. And so we moved out, for, out there for a little bit and then we came back here to um, the Midwest um, and have not left ever since then. And then started my family here where my kids are currently in the Saints Point School uh, District. Um, and my three oldest have graduated from the high school here as well. And then my other three children are still currently in the school district here. Um, I like the small town. Um, I do like big cities too, but I get irritated when there's traffic. <laughs> it's normal. Um, I tell everybody I live really far from my mom when in reality, I think she's like five stoplights away from me. Um, <laughs> five minutes if I hit all the green lights, 10 minutes if I hit all the red lights. Yeah. Uh, but that's like the mentality I have like when I go places, uh, especially when I'm in Minnesota, I ask my family like how long, how far is it? Oh, they're, it's not that far. I'm like, okay, so when you say it's not that far, it's like 30 to 45 minutes. When I say it's not that far, it's one stop right away. <laughs> um, you know, the comfort of Sins Point um, has changed somewhat. You know, it's slow. I um, can't say steady progress. Um, it is slow. Um, but it's getting summer. Um, I also served one term on the Saints Point Area School District School Board, um, I think in 2019. Um, it's been a while. I can't, it, my brain it is- It all blurs all together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's something about small towns. I, I think it's funny. I always have a story where uh, my cousin's wife, um, they live in North Carolina and it was winter here. 
And I went to the grocery store. I went to the phone store and she sat in the car and I was like, okay, maybe she doesn't want to go. And we get to the gas station. She's like, I want to go in too. I was like, so go in. She's like, aren't you going to turn off your car? I was like, no, why would I turn off my car? It's cold. And she came back and told my cousin who grew up here in Stevens Point. And he's like, why would you turn off your car? It's Wisconsin. No one's going to steal your car. You're in Stevens Point. You went to the gas station. It's fine. <laughs> and just the dynamics of like her growing up in a big city compared to us in a small town. Yeah. Um, just that sense of like so- somewhat sense of security. Like, um, you know, like I can run into the gas station with my car running. Um, yeah. You know, that's crazy. Yeah. Thing. yeah. Wow. So you're busy, a busy mom as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I wondered if you could share a little bit more about some of the work you've been involved with at Farmshed in terms of um, uh, food access for culturally relevant food access for Hmong elders and also some of the programs that you've started with the high school youth. I thought those were amazing. And I think our audience would love to hear about those programs. Yeah, so the Shiba program, um, or Shiba loosely translates to um to help one another, um, or helping hands is it was actually um put together by Cap Services Mount Uplets family. Um, they received a grant from United Way. This was a response to the COVID nineteen. What they had seen was that a lot of the elders um were not receiving meals because their caretakers or their children were either in isolation and quarantine, and so they wanted to ensure that they were receiving um food. And so for the first 12 weeks, they actually partnered up with the Tim Hong restaurants here in Stevens Point. Um, and at that point, um, I was volunteering for the program. I worked at CAP Services at that time. So um, working with the um, coordinator at the time for Uplift, he was like, hey, would you be able to volunteer? So we did all the volunteer work. Um, we had pickups on site. And so they were able to get um, um Hmong elders or Hmong disabled individuals. Um, so the meal is similar to uh, the Aging Disability Resource Center's uh, Meals on Wheels, um, but this is culturally relevant. And the difference was that if both parents in the home were disabled, any children who were under the age of 18 would also receive a meal. Um, and then after the 12 weeks that was up, they transitioned and partnered up with Central Rivers Farm Shed. And at that time, when I had time, I would come in and volunteer. And when it switched over to Farm Shed, it was on a delivery service. Uh, so we had volunteer drivers who would pick up the meals and then get that delivered. And this would be more towards the evening. And when it first started, it was twice a week. Um, unfortunately, due to funding, we cut that back to once a week when I started. Um, the way that the Shipa meals got into the school was actually me being a little bit of so, um, being selfish, um, thinking, man, when I was in school, you know, like I would always be hungry by the time two o'clock rolled around. Like it would be so awesome if we could get these meals to our students. And I have a friend who works at the high school where it's like, hey, can we collaborate, you know, on something like this so that. Um, you know, we could use, utilize your office or anything like that for these meals. So it wouldn't be like out in the open. Um, just we don't want to disrupt um, the food service and things like that. Um, and so that was a great idea. My uh, director at the time, well, he's still the director, but he loved that idea. And so um, funny is when I first started here, I worked for a different nonprofit organization. Um, I forget my title, but it was diversity, equity and inclusion. And so I was doing a lot of DEI work and a um, company here in Stevens Point or uh, Portage County had reached out to me and said, hey, would you come, would you be able to come to our round table and have a conversation with us? And I was like, sure, you know, like I am more than happy to come and work um, with you all. Uh, they, I believe their 70% of their employees are Hmong workers and they employ a lot of Hmong um, staff here in Portage County, some from Marathon County and some from Wood County. And so they wanted to know how they could be more inclusive and things like that. So we went out there and I walked in and I was kind of like, so my brain was still racking, like, how do I find funding for the SHIPA um, in schools, lunch program? And so I walked in and I don't know what his title was. He's like, you know, like, what's going on? Like, how have you been? So I'm just telling him about, you know, like our vision that we have. Um, and he ended up getting a phone call. And at the end of the round table, he looked at me, he, he's like, 99% sure I secured all the funding that you need for that program. Um, and so we were very fortunate that Monogram Loves Kids grant had provided um, the full grants, 
the full amount that we needed to run the program for the school year. Um, we didn't just do this blindly. Um, I think that my relationship with the school board um, along the school districts really helped because then I went out and attacked to the superintendent and said, hey, we found funding. This is what we would love to do to bring into the school. You know, there's a staffer at local high school who's willing to like work on this with me to collaborate to ensure that the meals are there. You know, Farm Shed has a commercial kitchen where we can prep um, the meals and then uh, properly transport it over in hot bags. I mean, when I talk about transportation, the high school is about a mile away from our location. So it's not a very long chance for it. And so that's kind of where the meal, the lunch program started. We started at 35 lunches once per week. Um, and it was a first come first serve base. Um, it was a little bit slow when it first started. So I did a lot of recruiting, telling my kids, tell my nieces, my nephews, like, hey, make sure you get these lunches. You know, it's only 35. And so the first couple of weeks is slow. We would have leftovers, which was fine because then um, my friend at the high school who was working with me would give them to different staff so that they would get to try or um, different students. Um, one teacher actually went to her and said, hey, you know, if you have extras, would you mind uh, saving it? Because we do have a student whose only meal is at school. And so we had that impact. We're like, yes, you know, for sure. And so it really caught on. So by the time January rolled around of 2022, I think, or 2021, I forget. It's been a while. We're in our third year. Um, they It caught on. And so we um, we move it to 50 meals per week. And so it has been where now kids are like rushing to get the meals. And at first it was strictly for Hmong students. And then we opened it up and said, you know, like anyone is um, is welcome to try, but we are asking that, you know, BIPOC students, BIPOC uh, Black Indigenous and people of color are, you know, um, they would get the first dibs on it. And so it really has grown. And every year um, that we've had it, you know, other students say, hey, don't forget to go to, um, um, don't forget to go grab your lunch. You know, you want to make sure you get this. And so I think it's a lot more than just providing the meal, but it, there's a lot of storytelling that happens behind it too. Um, I know that we've been doing feedback. I know that we've been doing feedback surveys from the students, seeing how they're feeling, you know, like, how are you feeling? How has, what has been like the impact and everything like that. And um, it has been positive. Um, I think every year as we continue to grow into this program, we get um, much more honest feedback uh, from these students. And um, I really treat them like my kids. Um, you know, I'm like, be honest. And they are brutally honest with me, <laughs> a lot of things. So, um, you know, I can't get away with a lot of things. So I'd be like, oh, you know this. And like, well, you forgot to put this. And it's like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I didn't realize that until like I was like packing. It's like, oh, I forgot this. And um, I think it was uh, Pad Thai when... I was making pad thai and I think I had forgotten either the green onions or the cilantro. And then they're like, you forgot this. And I was like, I know, I know. I totally forgot about that until I was packing it. Um, but, you know, um, I had just recently sent out a survey to these kids, you know, to see how they're feeling now, because now we have some students who are on their third year for this lunch program. And a lot of it has been like, it's been great because now I see my food that I eat every day. And, you know, not every day, but once a week, I get my home food. One question that was in the survey is like, do you come to school regularly because of these measures? They're like, um, I think it was a good percentage that had said yes, that I do. We, I am now attending school regularly because of these meals. And it's like talking about how do you feel? What's like, do, are you feeling more included and things like that? And they're really positive feedbacks. Um, and uh, another question I had asked in the survey was, you know, um, have younger children, um, you know, have younger siblings or younger students asked you all about how they can um, get these meals too. And so there's a lot of excitement about this. Um, so with that question, it's about 50-50. And then um, another question I posed is like, are there other BIPOC students who are asking you, you know, like, how do they get their cultural meals into the lunch program? And right now, it's, again, it's a 50-50 um, with like yes and no's. And so um, when I when I think about it, it's not it's it goes beyond a meal, you know. It, it goes be it's like the inclusiveness that you're feeling, um, like you feel like a part of you now belongs in the school. Like it's, it's um being more accepted. Um, stories I've heard was now instead of um white students saying you what is that? It's like oh what are you eating today? Like tell me about it. And so you know there's a lot of storytelling behind it and like um like memories of like that meal or that certain dish and things like that. Um, 
and that comes along with it. And that's, I think that's the best feeling ever is like, you know, there's a lot of work that goes behind this. Like I didn't just up in one day and be like, oh, let's do this. There's a lot of relationship building that I did in the past that I didn't realize that would lead to this positive um, program that we have at the high school. Yeah, I mean, food, if there's one thing that brings people together and builds community, that's it, it's food. Yes. And um, the piece about sharing culture between students is really powerful. Um, I just love what you said in your interview with Love Wisconsin about um, the importance of knowing and remembering where your cultural foods come from. Um, and it sounds like the space that you provide for students to share those stories with each other. There's just such deep value in that that's, like you said, beyond the food. It sounds like um, such an impactful program and that it's in its third year that impacts um, will only grow as time goes on. And I think that you're you're right. Not, you know, none of this work can really happen without the relationship building that comes first, and that takes time. So it's really inspiring that program. And um, you know, school lunches for kids to see themselves and their own cultures represented in those lunches, uh, along with the nutritional benefits, I think is so important. So that's just um, an amazing piece of your work that. Um, I admire a lot just from the outside. Yeah, so it is um it is like amazing because I tell them, you know, oftentimes when you're eating a local grown product here, I probably bought it from your mom or your grandma or your grandpa, you know? So, um, you know, like the food that you're eating is cultivated by your family themselves. And so like we we strive to use as much local products as possible. Um, but you know, with the school year running opposite of the growing season, um, we do what we can. Um, so if I'm using uh, more mainstream products, we have a program here for, called frozen acids, um, where we are purchasing from local farmers and we process it and it gets frozen. And so we use it that way too. And so I always tell them, I was like, I mean, if you were out there within the garden, you you probably harvested this for me or, you know, you took care of it. And I, I went out there and we purchased it from your family, um, you know, ensuring that we're continuing to support the local pharmacy here um, in the central Wisconsin area. And so it goes it goes beyond um that that feeling right it's like the memories it's the memories of you eating that meal maybe I always think about um dishes that my grandma cooked and I was like no one can make it the way same way as my grandma does or even like my mom like I washed her and you know um, when you're a cook you really don't measure anything and so I wash them cook but it never tastes the same and I'm like I think it's just missing like their their touch their love that comes with it um and so having these conversations with kids is, um, you know, going back to your question about why is it important to remember uh, to know where your food came from is because um, we migrated so much with like from persecution where we started like in like the mountains of China and we kept moving down to South Southeast Asia. And so like, as we lived in each part of um, Asia, we learned to eat um, different foods. And so um, a lot of times I tell the students like we, Home food is very bland, very plain. It's either um, broiled, uh, deep fried, or boiled or steamed, right? And so when we're talking about very specific dishes, sometimes it doesn't belong to us. And it's important for us to acknowledge that that is not really home food, but that is like an Asian dish. And so these students are very smart. And so when we have these conversations, they're like, oh, yeah, I know the origin of that. You know, like um, we tweak it a little bit to like our liking based upon where we're living. And so they find, I tell them it's it's important for us to acknowledge that um, where those dishes originally came from. And yes, we've tweaked it a little bit to fit our needs. Um, but we also want, we also don't want to take credit for that dish. Yeah, food really does tell a story of the movement of people and the movement of cultures and the fusion um, pieces that that dishes have picked up along the way. It's really um, amazing when you start thinking back and connecting the dots like that, where crops have grown, where people have moved and the food cultures that have come out of that. So um, kind of connected to that, I love how you talked about kitchens as being a safe space for Hmong women. And I wondered if you could share a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, sounds very patriarchal, and it is, but a lot of Hmong women do most of the cooking, um, if not all of the cooking, especially at like big events. Like I love 
sitting around and um, being like in the area with my mom, my aunties, my grandmas are cooking because I hear the best stories, the saddest stories, the most loving stories about, you know, just, just about anything. And um, I'm in the kitchen, not necessarily to be cooking. A lot of times I'm just asking a lot of questions. I feel like they're more receptive to questions. Um, and that's really where they open up um, safely. And, a lot of times you don't get to hear these stories out in the open until they feel that they're safe. And so I I get to learn a lot about um, the women in my life and, you know, like their struggles or anything like that. And it's like, then I really get to ask questions like, oh, like, why are we doing it this way? Why do we need to do it that way? Um, and so um, it's hard to ask my mom questions, honestly, because she's like, oh, you asked so many questions. And so usually I turn around and look at my aunt and go, do you know why? She goes, no. I was like, well, then you ask my mom, because if you ask her, she'll tell you. She'll be more patient <laughs> and she'll explain it to you. And she won't explain it to me because, you know, I'm her child and I should just know these things. Um, and so it's 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 a way for me to really learn, like, you know, how when I ask questions, my mom would just kind of like blow me off. And so I've learned that with my kids. And I, I started to like become my mother in the kitchen where I I'll ask my kids to do something I'm like oh yeah can you can you rinse a couple of green onions for me and they're like well what's a couple I'm like you know a couple um in Hmong we say all to pay through means like a few and so I would get two or three and I'm like why'd you give me two or three um you said two or three I'm like okay when I say a couple this is what I mean and so now when I'm giving directions I'm more intentional with like hey can you rinse the entire bunch of green onions um you know or like I have the two um uh, cucumbers in there can you take it out rinse it for me um and then cut it up for me and this how this is how I want to slice and so being intentional because I've learned that I've learned what to do in the kitchen um and not like what not to do um by giving directions because I'm like um it's not just about cooking but it's also how you're having conversations with one another um like in your head you're thinking well I know this so the next person should also know this or like my child should know this from observing well they they don't always observe the same way that we observe so having those conversations um really like open my eyes like okay I have I have to be more intentional um but yeah going back to that like I, I call it a safe space because we just know that not many men um come around um in the uh, what I call in the kitchen, but it's more like where the um women are cooking. Um a lot of times they are either sitting around having conversations or they have other um other obligations that they are attending to. And so um when we have really big get togethers, you get to see all your aunties, all your grandmas, um, all the moms. And so you really just get to reminisce like a lot of things. Or they start telling stories about, oh yeah, I learned how to cook this dish here. Or hey, remember that one time we went and we were foraging and this happened. And so you really get to hear like their life stories that they don't get that opportunity to sit down and have a conversation. Unless you sit there and be like, tell me your story. But then a lot of times when you're saying tell me your story they're like well what do you want to know about me like I don't really have a story you know until like they're like old and they're like oh let me tell you about my life story and it is sometimes it is heartbreaking um but I just feel like when they're cooking they're just in the zone and they're feeling safe and they really open up and I really get to learn about them I mean some I am very grown and sometimes I still learn new things about my mom or like my aunt or like my grandma um funny stories I actually never knew my um grandma's name um I just always knew her as grandma until she passed and then I was like um I asked my dad's um, sister I was like so what is grandma's name because on paper it's Y-U-A and the English pronunciation was always yo 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 and she goes oh yo um her name was Njoa and so of course my younger sister's name is Njoa as well and she's like oh I was named after my grandma and it's like whatever um, so, you know, a lot of times when home women get married, we lose our identity. Um, and so we're now known as like the wife of so-and-so. Um, and so I'm very intentional and I'm very, um, I'm very like adamant about using like my name, like my identity and things like that. Sometimes they'll be like, well, what are your parents' names? And I'll, I'll tell them what my parents' names are um, just so that, you know, they can, there's just that connection type thing um, and things like that. But um, yeah. But the kitchen, I feel like, is the best place for you to learn stories from um, your parents. Yeah, and those moments of just organic sharing of stories are so precious because our elders are not around forever. Mm -hmm. So finding those spaces where you can um, have those conversations and, you know, pass them along to your kids, it sounds like, in your kitchen as you do. Um, it's just, 
important, so important for us to have those spaces. So I just, I loved, I loved reading about that piece of, of the kitchen in your experience. Um, just switching gears a little bit, I wondered if you could also share about some of the food access initiatives that you've been a part of, um, like the local food purchasing assistance program and then the farm fresh and free produce program as well. Sure. So Badger Boxes came out, I think, in 2022 from the Hunger Task Force and Central Rivers Farm Shed. So I wasn't really part of that program. Um, we had an intern, and so she handled a lot of that. Um, so that's kind of where our food security program started was when the Badger Boxes was introduced. The Badger Box was locally grown or locally produced products of the state of Wisconsin. Um, then it would get shipped to us and we would individually box them for families and we would do distributions. Um, and then last year, the LFPA, the local food purchasing assistance program came out and I believe it was between like marble seed, um, Dad cap and the food hub. Don't quote me on Dad cap. I can't remember, but there's a couple of organizations that was involved in it. Um, and how did we get involved in it? Actually, um, I, I can't really remember how we were involved in it. Um, I think someone had reached out to us, Marble Seed. I think Marble Seed had reached out to us. Um, we didn't find out about this program until like pretty late. Um, and it was like November when we found out about it. And so we started we started doing outreach, going to community events. We had like a two week turnaround period to get the applications. And so we said, hey, there's this great grant. And, you know, it was the first type of this grant of any sorts that you know, like I'm familiar with or that um, the home farmers were familiar with. And so we had gotten involved and then we started going to the meetings and they had asked us to actually be um, a community partner support, I believe it was called, where we would provide support to farmers who needed assistance um, with the uh, uh, with the program. And then they asked us if we wanted to be an end user or a an organization receiving products. And we're like, yeah, we would love to. And so that's kind of where the Farm Fresh and Free program started, where we started accepting all these um, fresh locally grown produce um, from local farmers. And so last year we were working with, I wanna say 11, 11 farmers from Portage County and Marathon County. And so we distributed about $108,000 worth of fresh produce. Um, and I was fortunate enough that as an end user that I was able to communicate directly to the farm, to the home farmers. And so I had asked them, I was like, hey, I know this is out of the ordinary, but would you bring, be able to give us like um, culturally relevant produce? And like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, because, you know, I feel like with mainstream that's available like um, at, at lots of places, but like with our home folks, they really want culturally relevant produce. And so they were like, yeah. And so we started getting culturally relevant stuff. And again, just like any other program, it was pretty slow at first. Um, but then my sister is now the coordinator for the Home Uplift program, where she works with income eligible families. And so I was like, hey, can you let your families know that, you know, I have all these fresh products and have them come pick it up. These are my distribution dates. Um, and the way I actually had it set up was it was almost like a grocery store. So I would always have people bring baskets, bring bags, bring whatever you need to carry them in. You come in, you, um, you know, go through the income guidelines. Um, and we were very, we were very, uh, I guess you can say more relaxed. We didn't have rules besides you had to be income eligible. And so I would always tell them, so we collect information, but it's for our data purposes. You know, if it comes back, like um, we have to, if it comes back and says that they need anything that we'll give it to them, but we don't just give it out. Um, and so folks would come in and boxes would be set out and I would just replenish them as needed. And I would encourage folks to take as much as they want, um, especially if they're able to process it for later use in the year. Um, it's like, I get it that fresh produce is expensive, especially locally grown, can get pricey because, you know, you're a small farmer, you're a small producer. So you also have to pay yourself. And so I'm like, you know, um, especially if you're not, um, farming and so you have to purchase all of this and you're income eligible take what you can use you know I don't want you mm -hmm. to take a lot just because you feel like you're obligated um but if you know how to process it please do and it was great because we would have home folks coming in and we would have um, white community members coming in and so you know they would just kind of 
um, white community members would be like, hey, what is this? And, you know, before I could jump in and say anything, we had a home community member would be like, oh, this is what it's called. And you can um, cook it like this, this, and this. And if you don't use it all, this is how you can um, freeze it for later use. And so that storytelling and that recipe sharing really went across um, with the different individuals that we would get here. And so we really strive for the Farm Fresh and Free program is that yes, it's all locally um, grown and locally um, produced um, products here, um, but we don't tell you what you need to take um, or what you shouldn't take or how much. Um, we want to ensure that you are getting the correct amount um, for you and your family. Um, and we're really open to that. Uh, we had a, I want to say he was probably six or seven, came in. He's like, Dad, what is this? His dad's like, it's a beep. He's like, I don't think you're going to like it. He, his son was adamant about taking it um, and took it. And the next time he made the dad, his dad was like, well, apparently he loves beets um, because he is able to try because he was just curious to see what it was. Um, and so, yeah, the Farm Fresh and Free program um started um because of the LFPA program that was available to us as an end user. Um, this year we do also have the Farm Fresh and Free um produce program. However, it looks a little bit different. Um, we were awarded the community partner grants, which is also part of the LFPA grants. Except with this, we were awarded um the funding, so we get to work with farmers. Um, we get to work with specific farmers. Um, and we are contracted with them. So, um, I want to say. Majority of our farmers are either BIPOC or female owned farms. Um, and this year looks a little bit different because we are also getting in a bunch of meat products along with eggs. And I have been working with one of our farms to ensure that our goat uh, meat is going to be halal appropriate. Um, we know this is a little bit pricier, but we're like, you know, we are here in Portage County um, and we do have a bit of um refugee uh, community members who are looking for halal appropriate um, products. And we want to ensure that we are also including them. Um, I'm working with an individual um, who was a refugee from Afghanistan. And so she's been wonderful. She's been giving me lots of things like, hey, you know, we could really use this. Um, and then I've been working with a, um, I believe he's from, he's Congolese. And so working with him too, and he runs he runs, he's a coordinator for a program at CAP Services for refugees. Um, so I've been working with him to ensure that we are getting, um, we are getting culturally appropriate products um, for the different groups that we have here. And the funny thing is, um, working with the um, Afghani woman is that she has sent me a bunch of pictures and I started laughing. I was like, you know, that this can be grown here. She's like, are you sure I haven't seen it? I was like, yeah, because we eat these products too. And so there's like a lot of overlap with the products and we just didn't realize that. Um, and then with um, the Congolese um, person, he's like, yeah, I don't know what it's called. And it's like, oh, that's fine. You know, if you can find pictures, send me pictures. My farmers that I work with are super great and they can find out what it is. And so he sends me a picture and I sent it to my farmers. He's like, you know, what's funny. I grow this, but I don't really have a market for it. And so we found out that he grows red and green amaranth um, a lot. Um, and so I was like, well, now this year you have a market for it. And now that you know where that there is a market, you know, you are able to like market it more. Um, and so working for the um, running the FFF program has been awesome because you really get to see uh, what crossovers there are in products um, and then what specific needs. Um, unfortunately, there are some things that can't be grown here. Um, like I want to say, I believe it was like yucca root because um, that has to be like a dry, hot area. Um, so, but uh, working, working, I always say we can also talk to the local um, home stores here because those are products that they can get in. Um, and so there's a large need or if there's a need, um, the markets are willing to work with community members as well. Yeah, so you really are working with the consumers, you know, the people in the community looking, seeking out these culturally relevant foods, as well as the producers, the farmers who are growing them. Um, and that kind of brings up your current work at Groundswell Conservancy, supporting farmers in particular. I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, so my role over at Groundswell Conservancy, um, we do a lot of... Um, partnership with other organizations. So I work closely with a staff from UW Extension Madison and from Fair Share. And with these, we actually put on workshops um, 
and the workshops are presented in six different cities. And these six cities weren't just picked out. Um, there was years of roundtables and talks and then about like different needs in the community. And so our focus is specifically on home farmers. Um, there are five topics that we do presentations on and they're geared towards what each community need is. And so it's land access, market access, careers in agriculture, agronomics, and I always forget about, and, and another one, I always forget the fifth one. Um, and so the cities that we do these workshops are um, Manitowoc, Milwaukee, Madison, La Crosse, Eau Claire, and then the central Wisconsin area. Um, and we work with organizations who have some relationship with the far home farmers in their area. So then that way they can identify which topics that they want to have a workshop on, because what we need here in Stevens Point may not be the same as what they need in La Crosse. Um, and so we want to ensure that it is being very specific for each of the areas. And so when we talk about market access, their market access is huge, right? And so a lot of times when we're talking to home farmers, the market access that they're looking for is not necessarily how to become a wholesaler and how to be like wholesale readiness, like with the packaging and things like that. But they're more like, well, I'm already at the point where um, I am already producing high amounts. I want to be able to sell my products to other uh, markets. And so it's like, okay, so that's another, that's a piece of market access. And then there are some farmers who says, no, I need to learn how to do wholesale. And so like all the paperwork and things like that. And so that's like another piece to it. Um, funny thing is we have noticed that with these workshops is that we are kind of like at crossroads now with the farmers. Um, we have coined the term traditional farmers who are doing it like, yeah, this is, you know, like I like doing this for like my mental health or like for exercise. And then we have like our entrepreneur farmers um, and they're not necessarily older or younger. It, there's a really good mix where our entrepreneur farmers are like, no, this is my business. This is my farm business. And so they see it as a business, which some farmers don't see, some home farmers don't see them, um, them, farming as a business, more like I'm having fun and things like that. Um, and so our workshops are different from city to city where we can be in one city where they're more traditional farmers. And then we go to another city where they are more of the entrepreneur farmers. And so like when we're doing our presentations with the questions coming up, sometimes we kind of like shift the um, presentation to kind of fit those needs. Um, we don't intentionally do it, but it's based off of the questions that we're getting them from the home farmers. Um, and so these are really great opportunities um, for this. Um, I think the most difficult thing is that there is a disconnect between language. Um, and it's not so much like the language barrier, but um, agriculture language is still so new from home farmers. So when we're working with um, farmers whose language, whose language, whose language, who doesn't have English as their first language, and we're trying to interpret it or translate it, it gets difficult for us too, because then we really have to think, okay, like this is the word, what is the definition of that? And really being able to define that definition to them. And so we're working on that like slowly, but consistently where each workshop gets much better because it's like, okay, we're also learning from these farmers because once you explain what that term is, they're like, oh, so you mean like this? And I was like, yes, that's exactly what we mean. And so we're also learning from them with the terms that they're using so that we're using terms correctly with how they're using it. Um, so it is going, it is going. Um, and we have done a couple of workshops so far. We have been in Madison, Eau Claire, and La Crosse. Um, and we've got a couple of um, workshops scheduled. We'll be in Manitowoc in November and then in Stevens Point in September. And um, some of these workshops, what we call them um, office office visits. And so what we do is we work with the local FSA, that's food, that's Farm Service Agency, and then US, um, the NRCS office, that's Natural Resource, Natural Resource Conservation Services. Um, and so we actually asked to go do an office visit where they can do a presentation on their programs. 
And the reason why we do this is so that our home farmers are comfortable saying, yep, I've been to the office. This is who, you know, when I go in there, this is what I need to do. So there is a familiar, um, they're familiar with it, like the layout and just being a little bit more comfortable. Um, it's really great because um, there is a home staff for the NRCS. He's in the Chippewa Valley area. So we always invite him to our workshops because then he can go over all the programs. There's no language barrier and there's no cultural barrier. And so he can really explain it for them to understand. And I encourage a lot of the home farmers to um, speak to him first about all of the available programs that they're looking for because then he can explain it. And then what he would do is then he would point them to their local um, representative and then that's where they would go to the office and apply for services. Wow, it sounds like such a great model of kind of a community responsive way to offer these workshops, um, getting to know farmers and tailoring your workshops to what their specific needs are and making sure that wherever you can break down those cultural and language barriers, it happens. So that's amazing and needed, more of that needed. <laughs> so it, it is definitely new. And um, because we all work for different organizations, but we all have similar goals, um, we we tell folks that, that, you know, we may all work for different organizations, um, but, you know, like, feel free to reach out to any of us. And we created what we call the agri home agriculture directory. Um, so it's got our photos along with what we do and which organizations we work at and our contact information. So that way, you know, if we have someone from um, Madison, they can reach out to someone closer to them if they like, or, you know, if they're from like the Fox Valley area, they can reach out to someone who is doing similar work to what we are. And so and that support is there and we're being intentional with saying, yep, these are the faces and these are their names. This is their contact information. So then that way they become familiar with what what our roles are and what our organizations do. So then that way they don't have to wait for these workshops to, you know, meet us or have um, ask us questions like that. Yeah, sounds like a great opportunity for farmers to connect with one another as well through these workshops, mm -hmm. um, just to get support and ideas and resources from each other and from the collaborations between multiple organizations is such a great way to approach it too because every every piece brings a different angle. Mm -hmm. So um, it just sounds like it's it's building and I think time, you know, with time, it, it's going to become even, I, I just know that there's so much demand. So I, I can see this growing. And um, I just appreciate all the work you do in all of the different directions from the work you do with the youth and the elders and the meals, the work you do with um, just encouraging people to share stories and connect with one another and the work to support farmers. It's all, as you were saying, when we were talking before this workshop, just all of the pieces kind of organically fit together and grow out of each other. Um, and I just, appreciate the work that you do. And I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, and we are looking forward to following following all those pieces of your work with Farm Shed, with Groundswell as they go along. So um, if you're watching out there too, we'll put the links to those two organizations in the comments and when we, as we post this as a video so you can learn more about that work and how to support as well. So I guess that's a would be a great place to um, kind of wrap up our conversation. And if you could share with the audience some ways, if people want to support this work, how they could get involved to support. Yeah. So um, you know, we are working on a um, what did I call that? Like technical assistance for the lunch program. You know, how do you how do you get these meals into your schools? Um, and so for us, this unfortunately might be our last year providing the meals um, direct to the uh, students um, just because of funding. Um, if we get another funding source, we're more than happy to continue it. Um, but we are working with our school to see what we can do to bring these culturally relevant meals into um, the school district as, as a whole school district wide. Um, but you know, like I would encourage you all to work with folks. Um, I would encourage you all if there are culture specific meals that you want to bring into the school to work with someone who um who identifies um as an ethnic um group. That way, you know, they it's going to be more authentic and things like that. Um 
for farmer support, I love to just spread. Anytime there's grants available, I send that out to, I have a little bit of serve is what I call um, with all the farmers and I get that out. Um, how you can support is really being open to trying like new foods, um, you know, strange looking plants or strange looking fruits because that's really where you start to grow your palate um, from just trying new things. And don't be afraid to ask, you know, how do I cook it? Or like, you know, what is it? Can you explain it to me? Because I feel like a lot of the dishes that we have or the products that we eat have a flavor that is really hard to explain until you've tried it yourself. Um, so don't be afraid to try new foods, even if it doesn't look the tastiest, um, you would be very surprised um, with it. But yeah, for sure. Um, I would encourage you all to check out the websites um, for my organization to see what we do and what, our, what we continue to do. Um, and there are other Opportunities for Farm Shed, we have volunteer opportunities um, that we could certainly use here in central Wisconsin. Um, and so I would highly encourage you all to check out the websites. I believe Groundswell Conservancy, um, we also have volunteer opportunities for prairies that we also run. Um, so yeah, get to know the programs that are offered um, and really support and be open-minded. And I would encourage you all to go to school board members or school districts and say, hey, how do we do this? How do we get this into the school? Um, and last but not least, but definitely support your local farmers. Um, they are hard workers um, and they are striving to better themselves and their communities. Um, around them and they also love to talk about the products that they're growing and a lot of them are very open-minded and love to just talk about what they do and how they got there um, and using different products like one farmer I have he he's an IT person by day but he loves his farming um, he loves his farming and he has solar panels and his farm is entirely powered by solar and I believe he installed them himself so just different things um, that way and then I would also encourage you all to talk to um, youth or young adults about different careers in agriculture I think when folks think about agriculture they think getting down to the nitty-gritty and dirty um, and because that's how I think of it um, but there are lots of different career paths that you can get into agriculture like if you wanted to get into business you can do a a focus on agriculture business or like accounting, you know, like how do you do accounting specifically for a farming? Um, and then anything else you can really do, it can really be focused around agriculture. And something here at Central Rivers Farm Shed is that we are looking to really think about, have students think about um, culinary um, because think culinary, um, food nutrition, food science, things like that. So just think of the different opportunities that can happen with careers in agriculture. Yeah, it's a it's a big world out there. The food system is vast and in need of a lot of changes in a lot of spaces. So thank you again for all the work you do, Anne, um, in your little corner of the food system to make change happen. And thank you so much for joining us today and sharing some of your story and about your work. Um, thank you. Super appreciate you taking the time. And if you're tuning in at home, uh, don't forget to follow Anne and her work in those two different organizations. And we will look forward to just following you and keeping this connection going and seeing where, you know, we can potentially collaborate in the future. Awesome. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we'll see you next time.